Alors, le foie gras. Foie gras. Foie gras. Foie gras. Ah. Oh là là. For years now, there's been a tense battle going on over a luxury food called foie gras. We are here to protest the use of foie gras in your restaurant. Uji and Uji go. Foie gras has got to go. Now, let me be clear. I love foie gras. It's one of my favorite foods in the world, and I'm not alone. I happen to think that foie gras is one of the most delicious things on earth. French families enjoy it on very special occasions, and it's served in upscale restaurants all around the world. But there's a problem with foie gras, and it's not exactly the one you might think. Let me explain. As you may know, foie gras, which translates to fat liver, is made by force feeding either geese or ducks in order to, well, fatten their liver, turning it into a buttery delicacy. Allez, la perfection, hein? This force feeding practice, however, is understandably the subject of much controversy. Activists perform dramatic reenactments of force feeding using human actors in the hopes that we, the viewers, might put ourselves in the animal's shoes. And while some of these protesters might just be looking for an excuse to promote their OnlyFans, you can definitely see how there might be some ethical concerns here. Besides, it's not just PETA making a fuss. The production of foie gras is banned in several countries around the world. And now, even in certain French cities, foie gras is being banned from official events. Obviously, on the issue of foie gras, emotions are high. You have a group that passionately defends the tradition, and another that fervently criticizes it. And two-sided emotional conflicts like this are the perfect opportunity for bad reasoning. And so today, I, an idiot, I'm going to do my best to take a reasonable look at the ethics of foie gras. But before we dive into that, I want to understand how did we get here? Why is foie gras even a thing? And why does it matter so much to French culture? All right, let's see. I'm guessing this is probably like a couple hundred years old. In fact, the earliest recording of foie gras production by force feeding dates back to 2500 BC. That's older than things like candles or paper or Jesus, you know, BC. Eventually, the method made its way to Rome, where fat and liver was enjoyed by emperors and noblemen and all the boss players of Rome. That's where we really see foie gras emerge as a luxury product. This next part blew my mind. The Romans force-fed their geese dried figs, hence the name Iecur ficatum, liver figged, or fig-stuffed liver. And then ficatum, the part that means fig, became fegato. That's not a slur, that's the word for liver in Italian. And then it became foie in French. So the word for liver in Romance languages literally comes from the tradition of force-fed foie gras. I think I'm beginning to understand the cultural importance of this stuff. Fast forward a bit, and the Jews carry the tradition forward through the Middle Ages. The theory goes that since they weren't allowed to use lard or butter as cooking methods, they had to use something else. Of course, many Jews cooked with olive oil, but that was only readily available near the Mediterranean. So, instead they used fat and geese. And apparently during this time it was already a debated topic, with some rabbis concerned about the ethics in animal suffering involved in force feeding. We'll skip ahead another little bit, and eventually, foie gras becomes popular with, you know who baby, the French. Louis XVI called it the dish of kings and allegedly even traded foie gras for a parcel of land. You know, I did write The Art of the Deal. Did anybody ever hear of The Art of the Deal? I have a feeling the guy on the other side of that trade had some inside knowledge. Le foie gras, c'était vraiment un article de fête. Moi, quand j'étais petite, le foie gras, on ne touchait ça qu'à Noël ou qu'au jour de l'an. Mm -hmm. À l'année, il n'y en avait pas, mais c'est comme le saumon fumé. C'est le même principe. Euh, on touchait ça que pour les grandes occasions parce que c'était très cher, très, très cher. Today, the average French person has special core memories involving foie gras. I'm not French, but I remember Christmas at my grandmother's house. There was commotion, there were people all over the place, so much hype. And because I was so happy and present in that Christmas moment, all the food that my grandmother made tasted that much better and it stuck in my memory. That's how the French feel about foie gras. All right, now that we've got all that out of the way, let's finally talk about the force feeding. This is obviously most people's biggest hang up involving foie gras. People see the force feeding process and they think, well, that bird must really be suffering. The natural argument to make is how would you like a giant metal tube shoved down your throat? The answer is I wouldn't, all right? You might, that's fine. I wouldn't. I'm also human though, and geese and ducks are not human. They're birds. So I would like to know some anatomical differences that might be relevant. I'm not concluding anything, 
just noting the differences. Humans, for example, have a gag reflex. Geese and ducks, no gag reflex. That's why you see some water birds throwing crazy things down their gullet with no problem. Another thing, humans eat and breathe out of the same stupid face hole. This, this situation here. Geese and ducks, on the other hand, actually have a hole going through their tongue into their lungs, and then the main drag their throat for food, so they can stuff their face and breathe at the same time. Interesting. But this proves nothing about the animal's actual experience. So how do we really know if the bird is suffering? Well, I suppose it's tough to know for sure, but this study tried to find out. So basically they had four groups of ducks, all right? One control group that they didn't force feed or anything, it was just, you know, ducks. They had one group that they intubated, you know, meaning they stuck the thing down the, but they didn't force feed. They just stuck the thing in. They had another group that they force fed a little bit, but not a lot, just like a normal amount of food. And then finally, a fourth group that they force fed a lot, like the amount that you need to make foie gras. All right, get ready for big words. In each of these groups, at different times throughout the rearing and force feeding process, they measured the corticosterone plasma levels, which is a biochemical stress response. And what they found was no significant indication that force feeding is perceived as an acute or chronic stress by male ducks. But wait, 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 wait. Yes, that's great news for foie gras fans, but that doesn't actually tell the whole story. It's, it's frustrating that, that uh, money can uh, make the, the world believing in things which are not true, but- Say hello to Tobias. A man of many talents, a musician, a food scientist, a former chef of a Michelin-starred restaurant, and now founder of a startup that is trying to bring an ethical alternative to traditional foie gras. But frankly, nothing convinces me more than this man's hair. I mean, look at it. He's got smart people here. What we know about the brain also of ducks and geese is of course they feel pain, of course they have a wide range of, of emotions, understanding of the world, they have perception of the world and so on. And if you get fed with, with like this iron thing that they put into your throat, of course they feel the pain, they feel scared, and so on. Tobias points out a couple of legitimate flaws in this study. The first being that money talks. The study was sponsored by several French national agricultural associations, which probably all have an incentive to keep the economic machine that is foie gras running smoothly. And beyond that, I mean, it's Frenchman, what do you expect? Oh bah, it's no problem, huh? for the duck it's uh, no problem, huh? it doesn't hurt them. No, they, they like it, they like it, huh? but most of them, not all of them, but most of them, they like uh, it. It's like uh, my wife, she doesn't like everything, but it's for this we have the mistress. Huh? On day eight and day 13, you can actually see that there's quite a big increase in corticosterone after force feeding. But where's the mention of that in the conclusion? Well, in the discussion section, the writers did state that in this specific case, the small increases were due to the fact that higher concentrations were observed in just one or two ducks out of the 12 on these specific days. Similar slight increases or decreases were also occasionally observed in other groups, including the control group. But if you ask me, I don't see an increase like that in any of the other groups other than the fully force-fed one. Here's another potential flaw. This study took place on a farm in France that seems to use pretty artisanal methods. But this might not accurately represent the reality of most industrial foie gras production. In France, the ducks are required to be raised en plein air, or free range, until they move into either feeding pens or cages for the final days of their life. If you ask me, that's a much happier existence than most chickens have in the US, where their legs can barely even support their own weight, and they're crowded together, riddled with disease. And while it's true that mortality rates for ducks during the force feeding process can increase to about two to 4%, for chickens in the US, it's almost 5%. Now I'm not saying two wrongs make a right here, but I'm also not going to talk down to somebody that eats foie gras and then go order myself a 20 piece chicken McNugget. By the way, most of the French uh, uh, foie gras, which is on the French market, is not being produced by small farmers in France, but by some huge farmers in Hungary where they don't give a shit about what's going on with those animals. So yes, while ducks in France are often treated relatively well, at least up until force feeding, a lot of foie gras production happens in countries that care much less about ethics, even less than the French. But okay, what about the fact that geese in the wild will actually gorge themselves to store fat in their liver so they have enough energy for their migration? It's true that geese like to eat 
more in uh, autumn because it's a time when they have to prepare for the long flight over to the south. But then, in, in a normal way, they have uh, livers like 400 grams, 500 grams, highly, highly. I went to Elsass, to the small places with like really the farmers talking to an old grandma with our own recipes. Everybody has his own recipes all over there. You, you visit two people, two different recipes. But they use usually, they use foie gras liver that is not more than than, than six, seven hundred grams. Because what we are used to uh, eat as foie gras mostly is uh, from liver that is more than 1.3, 1.4 kilograms, even bigger. That's like you only eat fat. Furthermore, almost 95% of foie gras production today comes from ducks, specifically mullard ducks, which is a hybrid species that's not even migratory. Now we've seen in states like California where foie gras is banned that really diehard foodies are reluctant to give the stuff up. But if there were an ethical alternative that's delicious enough, like Tobias's happy foie, would anybody really even miss the real stuff? Well, that's what I'm gonna find out. I kidnapped two actual French people to see if they could discern the difference between a traditional quality foie gras from Maison du Bernier and happy foie, which is an organic duck liver that is naturally fattened after the birds have been slaughtered. And you guys are real French people, right? Right. Actual French people? We. Oui. You don't sound that French, but what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> What's that all about? <laughs> okay, donc on va goûter. Mm -hmm. Now we have foie gras bee. Okay, all right. Okay. Okay, Eva's, okay. Eva's got opinions. I've got my opinion. It has got opinions. I think I know which is which. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Got it. I don't see question, but I'm done. Tastes a bit ouais. different after going back to it. No, now she's confused. No, no. Même no. à l'odeur, c'est différent. Okay, last. <laughs> You're a house in this floor. <laughs> okay, c'est bon. Okay, just raise your hand if you prefer. Letter A. Attends. Par contre, le premier. Euh, euh... Prends ton temps. Oui, un peu, un peu, un peu. OK. Raise your hand if you preferred letter B. OK. OK, OK. Raise your hand if you thought letter A was the real, quote unquote, real foie gras. Eva, you thought it was A, was the real one? Yes. OK. Eva? I think the real one was B. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, and why did you think so? Well, okay. So I think the number A, the texture was different. Sort of like a foie gras that you would make yourself. A little bit more crumbly and not so like smooth. And I think I just recognized the taste of num of the B more. Like I'd had From it before. Having eaten. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think. A was a little like stronger and nuttier. Which you liked? Yeah, I did. Let's take them off, take them off. Okay. <laughs> so, Eva, congratulations, you were correct. Yay! <laughs> uh, no. B is the real. This is this is A. What? And this is B. Oui. And B was the real foie gras canard. From Maison du Bernier, où we on a tourné la dernière fois. Ah, ouais? I mean, both right? were really good. Non, je suis pas d'accord, celui-là c'est le vrai. <rire> non, le A c'est le vrai. Bah, c'est du vrai foie, mais c'est pas gavé. Celui-là il est pas gavé Celui-là il est pas, pas gavé, est-ce que t'es sûr Well. I think that was about the most interesting result we could have had. So, after having done all that testing and research, I guess the only question that remains is, now what? How do we proceed? I think it's safe for me to say that the ethics of foie gras, even if you get the very best stuff, are questionable at best. Having said that, I probably won't stop eating it on occasion. Does that make me a shitty person? Probably. But I will say that while Happy Foie didn't sponsor the video, they did send me a bunch of their product and I've been enjoying it a lot. So if an alternative like this is available to me, then I probably won't touch the traditional stuff. My main point is this. 
I think it's very hard to change people's behavior unless you give them an alternative that's even better than what they used to do. Just like, in my opinion, we're not going to save the environment by telling people to stop flying. We're going to have to come up with a better, more sustainable solution. And we're also not going to turn the entire planet into vegans. Instead, I look forward to technologies like lab-grown meat. And we're definitely not going to stop the French from eating foie gras. That's just the reality. So we might as well come up with an alternative that's more ethical, more sustainable, and most importantly, more delicious. Um, and that's it. No, all right. <sighs>